Welcome to the Sales Acceleration Show. My name is Michael Humlet and I'm the founder of Kiometic. And in this show, we only focus on accelerating your business and making more revenue. And one of the things that keeps coming back is doing negotiation, contract negotiations, terms and conditions, SLAs, all the legal side of your business, especially within tech companies. So I have invited, and it's about time we do this, a proper lawyer, somebody that eats, sleeps, dreams, law, and can solve it. Anne-Lane, maybe you introduce to our viewers what do you do? Uh, thank you, Michael, for the invitation. Uh, thank you for the introduction. My name is Indita Andrei van der Elstraat, managing partner of Four and Five. I founded uh, my own law firm only six months ago. Um, but meanwhile, uh, I have a very nice startup that's becoming a scale up uh, with 16 people in my team. Uh, in six months? In six months' time, yes. So there is a big, big mm. need for what you do. There's absolutely a big need, and we are in niche market. Yeah. Uh, we have high expertise in what we do. Uh, and I think we're one of the the sole players in the market having this expertise in house. So as a strategy, you need to dominate and go much faster. Even take it, take the market. Uh huh. Now I'm being challenged by a sales <laughs> expert. That's what I would say. <laughs> I, I must say that the strategy for the coming eighteen months is more like um, focus, uh, increase expertise, because. Mm -hmm. um, for us, um, the biggest challenge is, is what's next. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen in my career that uh, if I look 10 years back, uh, I was negotiating large ERP licensing agreements, yep. etc. Uh, mostly the also in fintech. SAP Oracle. Correct. Whereas today we see that the market has changed. Uh, now uh, technology means a bunch of uh, different applications. Also, mm -hmm. um, 10 years ago, we were not using WhatsApp in a professional context. No. Today, it's it's normal to use it even internally. It's a communication tool. Um, so we, from our perspective, it's very important to be able to, to see what's next, what's next in the market and what are the legal challenges? Because we all speak about blockchain, artificial intelligence, et cetera, et cetera. But what will it mean from a legal perspective? Yep. And the, our legislation, le legislator will not be able to keep up with the changing market. Mm -hmm. But we have to be able to serve our clients in what they're developing. Mm -hmm. Can I jump straight in? Because I hear you talking and I suddenly realized the last 10 years when the classic software business started shifting to SaaS business, software mm -hmm. as a service, also the model of selling changed exactly. dramatically. So I used to be a distributor. I would sell my software to a partner and a partner would then resell it to an end user. Right? Correct. Very classic handovers, all of that. No problem. Suddenly SaaS is there mm -hmm. and SaaS sells directly. They try to cut out the middleman sometimes, yet you have the middleman, but then you get in these really, really weird contractual discussions about the end user license agreement. Correct. And you right. can and even say, what's the next step? Because when you're yeah. having a negotiation with your end user, then you're still in a very typical negotiation. Mm -hmm. But my assumption is that the next point is, um, I've never seen a salesman of WhatsApp. I've never seen a salesman of multiple applications do that I'm actually, using. Do they actually have people working for them? Right? I've never sure. seen a person in any of these <laughs> Skype. I'm just thinking, about, yeah, it's <clears throat> scary. So the next thing for us in the challenge in legal work will be, what's the next thing? I assume that within five to 10 years, we will all purchase our software and our applications without having a legal discussion. So our focus will not be on negotiation anymore, but in making sure that the legal framework as of the beginning is correct, mm -hmm. that nobody drops out and it's um, that it's an, a correct contract, that it's not balanced only towards the supplier, but it's something that you can say, I click through, I accept and it's mm -hmm. fine for me. And I even pay by credit card. But still, and even uh, not only if we're talking about thousand, two thousand US dollars, even if we speak about higher amounts. Mm -hmm. I, I still see the very large amounts still is a very classic process. Mm -hmm. You go to the mm -hmm. RP, create a PO number, whatever you do, they'll still Correct. they'll not give you the MasterCard, whatever. The lower ones typically SaaS very low. You see them transacting very fast and actually nobody reads the EULA except once you get to larger banks and larger corporates, they will check it, but also not for the really low ones, I think. Correct. They kind of let it go because it's more on a personal mm -hmm. based kind of mm -hmm. thing. I never actually thought through this, but you're completely right. It will change dramatically. I also think we will start more talking bot to bot and that kind of stuff. If we go real AI and we pull it 10 years further, yeah. I'm getting Correct. scared. <laughs> so before we get scared, maybe I pull you a little bit back uh, to 
some of the lessons learned and some of the some of the things that you see like uh, maybe some use cases i think like the typical scale up has a lot of these negotiations how can they avoid some of the pitfalls and what would be your advice like okay guys when you make this think like this and these are some of the steps you need to do mm -hmm. so where do you want to start i just I, i think the first thing is think about your contracting process yeah you have of course i i could respond to you with a content um, mm -hmm. response but i think the first um thing that you should tackle is your your process mm -hmm. do you want to go into face-to-face -face negotiations or do you prefer to send over general terms and conditions together with a purchase order and hopes that nobody reads the terms and conditions so most people do huh? and <laughs> on the first page you just need to sign you get it yep. back and the deal is done yeah what we now see in the market is that even That's when good. we speak about large amounts yeah um most of our clients try to sell their product this way and they put the t's and c's on the website public and then they just make referral in the in the offer that's what i see most it happens doing. but if you speak about a substantial amount of money it's mm -hmm. preferable to have it as an annex yeah. uh, because if you need to go into litigation it's always best to be able to prove what version of the general terms and conditions okay. and if you i think it's a good idea to do business like this but the moment you decide to do so the most important thing is put a balanced version of the general terms and conditions. Mm -hmm. Don't ask your lawyer, make it 100% it. Yeah. favorable in my favor, because it will not fly. Mm -hmm. It's not because it's in a very small font that nobody will <laughs> read it. Uh, the purchase tricky, and the compliance yeah. departments of larger corporates uh, still read it, but if it's balanced, it will pass. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's, I think, my first advice. And then the second is um, you, always have to take into account and that's uh, some misunderstanding some people have even you're selling software you might be into a regulated um, environment mm -hmm. if you're developing a separate software application that is used um, for example in a courier service you still need to comply with all the regulations mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if you're in mobili mobility you still need to comply and check the insurance company mm -hmm. The speed of startups and scale-ups is sometimes that high, they all start already start walking without being able to run. Um, or sorry, it's the other way around. Yep. Anyway, uh, in the startup world, you see uh, all these kinds of things. Um, and that's where I can understand. Sometimes people say, okay, first we go to market. We want to challenge. We want to see, we make sure that we're able to sell the product and then we will set up a company. Then we will see whether we need funding because of the SaaS world. It's very easy. Your investment it's the is sales, sales way. You mm. first sell it and then build it. Engineering ways first build it and sell it. I mean, correct. Yeah. Correct. But some, some of the cases I've seen might cause even criminal uh, sanctions. For example, um, we've been focusing on the legal framework of ICOs and mm -hmm. uh, the, the initial coin offering. It's prohibited in Belgium. Mm -hmm. But I've seen startup companies coming to me and saying, I'll do it. I'll do it tomorrow. Okay. And I said, um, do you know that? Yeah, I know it's prohibited, but it's the easiest way to get a funding. So I'll do it. I'll get 2 million euros in only 48 hours. So <laughs> I don't want your advice. I don't want to pay a bill of a lawyer. Mm -hmm. I will just initiate it. The only thing I could bring up was, okay, then at least <laughs> could you please use a management company or do you somewhere have a company to have unlimited liability? So then if you, yeah, they find you, you, yeah. And that's, that's what I mean by saying, always be careful. Huh? So what about like, one of the things I always, what is completely ignored is like warranties and that kind of stuff and SLAs on, on, on SaaS software. If we mm -hmm. stick to SaaS for a minute, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because that's something very different. In, in all the others, you had the minimum X amount of years that you pay, and then you had the minor major updates, updates, all of that. What about SaaS, actually? What, what, what's, what's your advice there? Should you limit it very much, or should you just open it? Or blah, blah, Because oh. if you buy something for 50 euro a month, if, uh, I mean, if you're setting up the whole organization behind mm -hmm. it, it's tough. Mm -hmm. what, I, what I've seen in the past is that... Um, by doing a copy paste, mm -hmm. um, some of the startup, even scale of companies, they thought this looks like a very nice SLA. Mm -hmm. uh, let's just use it. But then they included uptimes, response times, but also resolution times. Very and they were not dangerous. thinking about who will pick up the phone. Mm -hmm. Do we have coverage? Do we have people in the weekend? Will it work? 
Uh, I think everybody can live with the fact that if you spend 50 euro, 50 euro a month, for example, on a SaaS product, never, nobody will pick up the phone. Mm -hmm. Microsoft will also not pick up the phone. No. But the moment you spend much more, people expect that somebody picks up the phone yeah. and that you get a response in a certain time. So uh, my advice would be <laughs> never to copy the terms and conditions of another. It, because what I see is copy pasting sometimes can be useful. Mm -hmm. But if you do not understand what it means, you don't read it even. Yeah. Exactly. It's like find and replace. Yeah, find and replace. <laughs> and um, the diffi most difficult thing in reading a contract is reading what is not wrote, written. Yeah. Your opposite party will never by himself include a limitation of liability. Mm -hmm. But if you read the contract, you will not think if you're not a lawyer, there's no limitation of liability. If you read, uh, for example, if I turn it the other way around, if I sit at the uh, purchasing side, mm -hmm. um, nobody will include a resolution time for itself. No, of course, it would be crazy to it do would that. Be cra except if you know that in your kind of business mm. in fintech, for example, <laughs> you will not fly if you're not proposed mm -hmm. by yourself a resolution time. Um, so um, being able to read what is not written, that's why you need a lawyer. Yeah. That's your value prop, actually. It's exactly, even more yes. Than now, now we're getting into the mood. I have two other questions. Something that okay. always pops on my desk is NDAs mm -hmm. and penalties. Okay. So in essence, I always say I don't do penalties. In some very rare cases, when they really, really want penalties, I always want it mutual. Mm -hmm. I don't know. What, what would be your advice around NDAs and penalties? Because that, that NDA thing is something you see in startup scale-up life coming mm -hmm. back all the time. Mm -hmm. And then I've read in my life, I think, 100. They're all just a little bit different. I've mm -hmm. never seen one being effectively went to court, put in place the whole. So I'm, I'm wondering how far can you stretch it? What, what, what will be your advice mm -hmm. on, on this? I've seen a case where um, the NDA and the signing of the NDA um, uh, blocked the entire sale of the company in the end. Because apparently the founder signed an NDA before starting his own company. Oh, and apparently the entire company was based on the IPR of your liability company. so ndas are important um it's Good god i'm getting scared. yeah and, and um, <laughs> why you should uh, an nda everybody because what we have for example in our law firm we, we have mm -hmm. a checklist we send it over to clients it's something that's off the shelf and if you want to read your ndas by yourself you just use the, the checklist, checklist and, say, uh, and yeah. you say okay this is in this is in it's fine i can sign it right. um, it's not a challenging legal work mm -hmm. to, to review an nda that being said what is sometimes hidden in an nda is an uncompete clause yeah and that's yeah, that can be also the end of your company. Yeah, exactly. And it happens a lot. Also on non-solicitation, the fact that you cannot touch um, the other one's uh, employees. That's something you see a lot. As you see is, it, a lot. Is, that, is that such a problem? If you sign, if, it depends of, of your business. But if, uh, for example, you sign up as a startup for an NDA with uh, Ernst & Young. Yeah, yeah, okay. In that context, I fully agree. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah, it's... It, yeah, you get after a while, you get so much of these things that you get common sense for that's going to work or not. What about the, the, the date? Something I always wonder, you have people that put in like 10 years of an NDA. I'm like, this is mm -hmm. completely stupid. I mean, Facebook didn't, now it exists, but I always say the argument. I mean, two years, things will be different. Mm. I think it's common practice to put in five years. But the Still reason, five, because yeah. I try to push the tree always. I think yeah, in three years, everything changes again. So yeah. The reason why there should be a number in it yeah. is uh, under Belgium law, you have two kinds of agreements. So one is unlimited in time, and mm -hmm. that you can always stop with a reasonable notice period. So okay. the reason there's a term in it, because at least you are sure about the term. Yeah. If there's no term in it, because that's also a very interesting case I had once, mm -hmm. uh, there was a sign in the on the table, but it was unlimited in time. So yeah. then you just end the engagement with a reasonable period of time mm -hmm. and you get rid of it with a few months time. One more question on the non-compete because um, my mind mm -hmm. is racing. I'm thinking because I got a question very recently. Somebody signed and we ha they had the discussion. I was there and they said, okay, it says non-compete. But what do you do if you go on stage and you speak in front of a large audience mm -hmm. where your competitors of that company could be? You cannot be liable for that. You have does it mean you need to adapt the NDA for that? So to cover that practice? So imagine I sell software. Mm -hmm. I sign an NDA with you. Mm -hmm. And basically you say there is a non-compete. You cannot sell to other companies doing the same thing as okay. I do. Right? right? The day after, I'm on a stage. Mm -hmm. All your competitors are in the room and mm -hmm. I'm explaining stuff. I'm not selling to them, but I'm explaining parts of yeah, the IP. That's, and all that. 
Is that is that something you need to be worried about or not? No, no, no. Because a non-compete is about ex- actually doing business. Business. Yes. Okay. Even if they are paying you to be on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> trying yeah. to find holes in the. <laughs> okay, another one, another one. But because that was way too detailed for this show now, another one is one of the things that I I hear a lot and I keep getting back is okay, dear friends, you have a company and it can be a pretty large. What if you go broke? It's one of the things that keeps coming back from mm-hmm. small to larger companies, actually. And then some very large companies went bankrupt. So what do you answer there? What do you do? What do you do there? How can you mm. cover that? I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is escrow. Mm-hmm. But wha- is that the right way to yeah. answer it? Because it's a painful process. It's a very good question because you see now in the market that a lot of large corporates, um, not only because it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's cool to buy from startups, but only because they're not able to innovate themselves. Exactly. Uh, but they still, their compliance department is completely different and it's like, yeah, what are the risks? And indeed, if a startup will go bankrupt and they implemented their software as a core product, what will happen? Um, the best answer to that question is indeed escrow. I mm-hmm. suggest escrow. M- maybe However, explain very briefly what escrow is. Uh, escrow means that a third party, an independent third party, will um, get possession of your source code and whenever you go bankrupt mm-hmm. the source code will be released to your client so it's basically you put the source code in a vault in a very simplistic exactly, way yes. somebody gets yeah. the key if things go bad they go to the person exactly. with the key. but yeah okay the problem is that such escrow agents uh, there is a cost link to it it's pretty expensive it's eh? pretty expensive and yeah. it's market practice that the client picks up this bill yeah However, depending on the amount you're speaking about on a yearly annual subscription basis, it might be that your escrow fee is higher than your <laughs> subscription fee. Of course. We have a, a, a solution to that. Um, you will not go bankrupt just day by day. Mm-hmm. Your clients might know in advance. So sometimes clients accept the clause where you say that instead of saying we will upon signature of this contract sign an escrow agreement that you say that upon first request of the client whenever in the future your client asks for you do we escrow. will engage ourselves to do the escrow agreement and only as of that moment the, c- the fees will start that's a much more healthy approach that's a compromise yeah but is escrow the only answer to that on the bankruptcy because it's a tough one uh, it's a very tough and one. i've seen lots of corporates when you do that mm-hmm. backing off just you saying we can do escrow was enough for them to say, mm-hmm. okay, okay, they understand the mm-hmm. risk. And then basically they didn't mm-hmm. do it because of the pain and the hassle. Mm-hmm. Right. I must say it's the only solution to that problem because of the fact that you go into bankruptcy law. Yeah. Whenever you go bankrupt, the curator in Belgium will take over and it's not helped to, um, uh, to each and any agreement that you already signed on a long yeah. term. So in, indeed, that's one of the solutions, escrow. Another solution is to say, why don't you invest in my company? Then you're sure about it. Yeah, but I, on the other hand, would then, I wouldn't advise you because typically the first big customer that comes along says, I really think this is a valuable solution mm-hmm. and they want to invest. The problem is when the moment you do that, imagine you're selling in the retail space mm-hmm. and the lads of color, one of these guys mm-hmm. looks mm-hmm. at you and says, I'm going to invest. You basically kill all of the other. You can't go to the market anymore. No, it depends. It depends. Um, I've, I've had cases and there are solutions to it. Um, first of all, in Belgium, it's still not public who's your shareholder, except if the shareholder is represented in the board of directors. Mm-hmm. You could explain to the LESA, for example, sorry, but you're not invited to the board of directors. You will not be represented in the board. You will not get the access as a board member. Mm-hmm. So that's a way to say, to, to keep it confidential that the LESA is one of your shareholders. You mm-hmm. should not disclose to each and any client who's your shareholder. But Another then you're kind of lying. Mm-hmm. Eh? No? Just challenge you. I mean, I'm a sales. I know all everything about mm-hmm. a different <laughs> type of truth. Everything. So I'm thinking, ooh, yeah, okay. It's not the first question that you will get when you walk into a room and you're trying to sell. You will. N- you could always say, my cap table looks like this. And you just divide it in and you say, my investors, it's 10%. You don't have to say who the in- identity of your 10% mm. investors are. Um, so that's one thing that you could say, okay, you invest. We keep it uh, confidential. Um, uh, another important thing about big corporates investing in your company is that uh, they get a certainty about what's going on. Um, and it's not because they invested in the first place that it should stay in your equity forever. Mm-hmm. And whenever you accept, for example, the Lazer to invest in your company, 
it's good to have a clawback clause yeah. where you say, okay, you're the, fir the early adapter, you invest, but we might need to think about what happens if indeed we start to discover that we've been perceived as a Deleuze company and the market is not reacting in the correct way? Why not already discussing the divorce papers? Mm -hmm. What about if we go, if we want to separate? Because if in a Belgium entity, you're a shareholder, getting somebody out of their shareholdership, it's not provided in the legal code. You have no. to uh, discuss putting call option, etc. Um, so that's something that I would highly recommend whenever you discuss, uh, these, you have these discussions. Okay, very good. Is there something else that you see as a pattern coming back? You say, Michael, God damn, I wish they would have done that. Something you see keeping back. I mean, you, we, we immediately talked about um, NDAs, uh, EULAs, we talked about uh, the, the supply negotiations, we talked about SLAs, help desk, T's and C's. When you go bankrupt, how do you deal with that? I mean, we mm -hmm. kind of covered a lot already. Mm -hmm. uh, something else? I think uh, it's not really a, a legal recommendation, but in mm -hmm. general, each and any lawyer, not only in our firm, but whenever you discuss and you explain what your business is, it's like a doctor, just on discussion of one hour, a lawyer can say, these and these are the risks. Mm -hmm. And that's something that you should know even after thinking only one month about your business. Mm -hmm. Because this risk can also jeopardize your idea of doing business. It could even detrimental for your business that mm -hmm. you have to say, okay, maybe this business idea was not sh such a good idea because you end up into regulatory, etc. So my advice would, whenever you think about an idea, you have the financial feasibility, you have the business sales side, but have this first discussion just in due time. Liabilities check, make sure that. Yeah, just to get an overview of w what will be the topics that you will have to be working on. Mm -hmm. It's not because a lawyer in this first conversation will say, okay, whenever you start in business, you will have to t pick up the GDPR part mm -hmm. that you have to do it immediately. But at least as of the very, very, very beginning of your business, you should know what the topics are mm -hmm. and when, which topic will rise in when moment in time. So, my dear friends, I think it's about time you all rewrote your T's and C's and your SLAs and all of that. Thank you very much for that share of wisdom. And I hope we all make sure that we don't run into troubles later on. If you like what you've seen, give it a thumbs up and subscribe for a lot more. And Alain, thanks for coming and sharing. Thank you very that. much. Bye.